quiet, guys. We are, we're live. Um, coming a little bit later today, I just had some things that uh, we had to do. Um, a lot's been weighing on me this, this week. Uh, last Sabbath, we were here, we recorded, but for whatever reason, um, we had technical difficulties and the sound was was faulty. It sounded like a, it sounded like a strobe light of sound. It was just in and out, in and out, like going in and out of signal. Um, and so I, I, I sat there and debated for a while uh, what to share this week, and it just it keeps coming back to me. My message last week was of such importance that I I need to go back to it. Uh, so if you heard the sermon last week, um, it might be a little bit of the same, and, but if you haven't, uh, God willing, um, that's what we'll be doing this, this Sabbath. Um, this one? Amen. Amen. Come on, come on, start some prayer and song. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We enter his gates with thanksgiving today and his court with praise. It's so wonderful to be able to just gather virtually in person uh, on the Sabbath day. You know, honestly, it doesn't matter to me what day of the week we gather. It's just taking time out uh, to just focus on God and honor Him. And we definitely believe in keeping the Sabbath day from, from Genesis. But I just want to thank God for how wonderful He's been for the beautiful spring uh, that is upon us, the beginning, Father God, of uh, a year. So I just want to. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much, God, for all you've done for us, for all the many things you've brought us through. For God, how your grace has always been with us and your mercy, oh God, that endures forever. Father, we thank you so much that you sit on your throne and you look down and you consider, man, who are we that you are mindful of us? You are so great with all your splendor and all your glory and how your train fills the temple. God, we just lift our hands to you and our hearts today. We are asking for your glory to come and fill this place, fill our hearts and even those that are watching us today, that you would touch them in a special way. Bless the man of God as he brings forth the word. Bless me, oh God. Father, as I sub sub submit to you these songs, Father God, just let it be a sweet fragrance in your ear, Father God. Just um, bless those that are joining us today. Father God, we thank you so much, Father, that we have the victory. Father, that we are more than conquerors, Father God. That we have power over all the power of the enemy, Father God. And that you are our redeemer and our savior. We are so grateful that you loved us and that you sent Jesus Christ to be, hallelujah, the propitiation and the, the redemption and, and, and the, the lamb and the blood that we needed to wash us white as snow. We are so grateful today. and We just thank you, Father God, for everything you do. We give you the glory. We surrender ourselves to you and we ask that your Holy Spirit will have his way today and just touch us, oh God. Help us to be new. Renew us, oh God, with your spirit afresh. Anoint us, oh God. Touch us in our minds today, God, in our hearts, oh God. Heal us, Lord God, wherever we need to be healed. And we're thanking you for all these blessings in the name of your amazing, wonderful son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, God is so good. Um, amen.
A B uh, Sometimes I feel like I'm the luckiest man in the world because uh, getting to hear uh, my wife's voice like that because um, I'm already getting teary-eyed and weepy-eyed uh, just contemplating and thinking about the things that have uh, been on my heart this this week. Um, of course, I've, I've given the, uh, the the title of this uh, Christianity or Churchianity. Um, when the COVID quarantine and churches shut down and everybody went home, um, I was moved upon to continue this, to do this. Why? To be honest, I don't know because I'm not I'm not all that uh, dyna dynamic of a person. I'm just I'm as I, I look at myself and I'm just the most unassuming, almost I'm on the introvert side of the scale. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not one. I'm not the life of a party when I go places. Um, but I was clearly told. In, in, in my prayers and in my contemplations that I needed to continue doing this. Um, I don't have an, an audience. I mean, I have my family. Uh, but as we're getting close to, we're starting to see a light in the tunnel, tunnel and, and churches are beginning to open up again and people are starting to go to church again. It's obvious to me uh, to some extent, why this is. There's no purer form of church than within your own home, with your family, with your children, uh, with friends, that that is where, in its, in its simplest and most pure form, is church. I remember when I was a teenager going to and visiting a historic building. It was a historic chapel, and it was the, one of the most beautiful chapels I'd ever seen. I mean, this chapel was immaculate, accented with gold and beautiful colors. Um, you walk in, and it just takes your breath away about how beautiful it was. But at the door of this chapel, because this chapel was used on a, on a weekly basis, at the door of the chapel it said, please no children or infants. To reduce distractions. And to this day, that still rubs me wrong. As a, as a teenager, Entering this chapel and seeing this sign that said, please no children or infants, rub me wrong. Because there's nothing more precious to God than church in a family. Church with your children, with the distractions, with the voices, with the crying. That is where the Spirit of God really exists. It's not in a sanitized, quiet place. And it seems like American church has become so sanitized. We're more, we're more concerned with, with the production. We're more concerned with uh, the, the, the preacher's preaching and, and the experience than we are with, with life. We have so sanitized out real life out of church, out of our church's experience, that's become something different. It's not, it doesn't reflect real life. To the point where now we, we dress up in our finest clothing um, and we print paint on a smiley face. We go to church, we meet friends, they ask how we are. Oh, well, things are wonderful, beautiful. Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. And then we go home. And so many of us are empty. When we leave, we go to church looking for something, and when we leave, empty. And so my, 
in, 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 during this COVID pandemic, bringing church back to our home and experiencing it with our children, in, in real life, <laughs> there's, there's thumps, there's bumps, there's children speaking and, and fussing, where everybody can hear it. I've realized that that's where, that's where true religion is. And so my hopes is that as we go back to church, as we go back to the churches that we once attended, that it's different. That we're willing to accept real life, that we are no longer going to church trying to sanitize things and pretend things Pretend that it's not, pretend that what we present ourselves in church is real life and we ignore and hope that somehow we can separate ourselves from reality. When the truth of it is, walking with God is not easy. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. And we need to be willing to embrace that in our assemblies, in our congregations, in our churches. Discipleship is messy. We're not here to put on a prediction, a, a pep rally, to make yourself feel good for one hour a day, one hour a week, and then to go home and forget about church. In fact, James talks about that in the first chapters of James. He talks about a man looking in a mirror, and then as soon as he leaves to go out to work, forgetting what he was looking at. True Christianity is not a weekend experience. It's not something we do for a couple hours on Sunday or Saturday and then go home and then live our secular life. True Christianity is a lifestyle. Our churches, our assemblies should be a reflection of our church, of our walk with God at home. But yet we have allowed the world to consume our houses and now we see the world consuming our churches. Because in all reality, our churches have become a reflection of our homes. You know, you walk into a house, the typical American house, and you go into a living room and what do you see? The whole living room is focused around a big TV that's connected to the world. And we spend most of our time throughout the week allowing the world to penetrate our home. And we, you know, we have people justify that, oh, there's good stuff on cable or satellite. Absolutely, there's good stuff out there. But how much of what we allow in our home is actually that good stuff we talk about? How much we allow in our home is filled with filth, filled with violence, filled with the things that we hope to separate ourselves with the church. True discipleship, true Christianity is not just a weekend activity and not just a, a title or a group that you align yourself and say, oh, I'm a Christian. No, true Christianity is a, it is a lifestyle. It should consume us every day, 24-7. Now, I'm not, I'm just guilty. I'm not going to sit here and say that I am the perfect Christian or the perfect disciple, and that I don't get distracted, and I don't let things interrupt me or distract me from my walk with, with God.
but it needs to be our home needs to be the center and the focus of our walk with God. How many of us, the first thing we do when we wake up is we get on our knees and we pray? Most of us, the first thing we do is we go to the coffee pot, or we go to our phone, or we check our message, or we go to Facebook. And yet, we ask ourselves why we feel empty. You know, I once hear, heard a pastor preach and, and say and talk about that every one of us were designed and created by God with something missing, with a hole in our heart that only one thing can fill, and that's Jesus Christ, that's God, that's a, a walk with Him. But yet we spend our lives trying to consume entertain and fill ourselves with other things to fill that specifically designed need in our lives and in our hearts for God with the things of the world, with television, with social media, with addiction, with chemicals, with whatever it is. And we've gotten to the point to where we put more faith in the world than we do in God. You know, I was reading through Matthew, through Mark, reading about Jesus when he was healing and when he was delivering people from devils. And it became more, more and more apparent to me that the church during Jesus' time, I'm not talking about the gospel that, that the disciples and the apostles established and, and the churches that they founded. I'm talking about the established church, which was the synagogues, which was Judaism at the time. They were more focused on churchianity. They were more focused on going to the synagogue. It could be a complete, it could be a complete substitution with church today. Having an experience and going home. And so when Jesus shows up and, and John the Baptist, and Jesus is casting out devils in the synagogue, and he's healing people in the synagogue, the leaders of those churches were more concerned with the way that Jesus was, wasn't playing Christianity. That Jesus was doing things in church that could be ugly. You know, we read about Jesus when he's healing people. People were afraid. People were more afraid of the fact that Jesus was healing than the fact that people had demons and demonic influences in their life. And where are we today? We go to church, and so many of our churches, they don't want to deal with that. It's scary. It's messy. Well, guess what? Spiritual warfare is messy. It's scary sometimes. It's difficult. And yet we want to turn our eyes, turn our heads away from it, turn our bodies away from it when we go to church and pretend that it doesn't exist and that somehow Christianity and our walk with God is a kumbaya, sanitized experience that we do once a week. We've allowed our churches to become nothing more than pick-me-ups and pep rallies. And yet... We are not willing to get in the trenches with people's lives and get into the mess. So often people come to church and they say, man, I've had a tough week. And somebody in church will say, oh, brother or sister, I'll pray for you. What we need to do is not just pray for people, but pray with people. Pray on people. We need to bear each other's burdens. We need to bear each other's sorrows. And be okay with that. Be okay with going to church and saying, you know what? I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. The adversary has been beating up on me all week. I've been struggling with smoking. I've been struggling with drinking, with drugs, with lust. And allow sisters to surround us 
and pray with us and pray on us and not just pray for us when I say my nightly prayers. We have turned our backs on what spiritual warfare is. We have, when it comes to mental illnesses, you ask, well, where's the miracles? Where's the healing? Where's the deliverance? The same reason the people in Jesus' time, they didn't believe. There was no miracles going on. There was no deliverance going on because they lacked the belief in the faith. They put all their trust in physicians. And what do we do today in our society, in our world? We put all of our trust in physicians. Everybody running around afraid of COVID. I'm not saying that we should be cautious. We should wash our hands. We should practice good hygiene. But we're running around afraid of catching this bug and putting all our trust in the medical society. I'm not saying that doctors are not good. You break an arm, you break a leg, you cut an arm off. A doctor is absolutely good to have. But where is our trust? Where is our faith? When somebody, somebody is struggling with depression, we want to give them drugs. When what they really need is Jesus Christ. Where what they really need is deliverance. And we're not going to see this kind of revival. We're not going to see this, these miracles start to happen until we start to turn to God and believe in Him and believe that He is sovereign and all powerful to do all. We hear so often that we're praying and looking for a revival in the church because we're watching so many churches die. Here in our own community, there's a church that's been here for years. We have churches all over in the South that have been around for 100 years or more, and they're closing shop because nobody goes anymore. And we ask our, ourselves, why? And they, we see churches that are dying, and they're, they're frantically trying to bring in new members through enticings of children programs or this program or that program, but they're not willing to change. They're not willing to go back to the very basics and beginnings of what church is. If we truly want revival to happen in our communities, in our lives, we need to dispense with churchianity, dispense with the weekend activity, and begin to get on our knees and plead and pray with God and believe that He is capable of healing. Begin to be, believe that God is capable of all things. God created this universe. He created everything around us. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And He will when we begin to believe as a church, as a body, that He is capable of these things. So my hope and my prayer is that as we go back to church, if you're feeling empty when you leave church, maybe there's a reason. Maybe you need to focus on your daily walk with God and let that carry into your church. And take that to church rather than taking all your baggage and all the world that you have accumulated throughout the week and your entertainments and your social media. We need to return to what Christianity is. And James says in the first chapter that true religion is not going to church and having a great time and boy, that was a great message. No, true religion is ministering to the widows and the poor and their afflictions. 
and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. So my prayer is that as we go back to church, as we find if, if we're going back to the same church family or we're going to a new church family, that we don't seek to for a, a great experience, a great pick-me-up, a great pep rally. That we're going, we're asking, we're saying, God, here I am. Do with me what you want. Put me to use. When was the last time you've gone to your pastor and you said, here I am, what can I do? What can I do for this body? Instead of going and expecting to hope and hear a great message or what this church can do to me. We need to go back to church. We need to go back with our church families. With a renewal in our hearts and a renewal in our life where we are going back living a new lifestyle, a lifestyle of discipleship and not a lifestyle of entertainment and worldliness. So if you haven't already, Start that lifestyle now. Start now. Tomorrow morning when you, when you wake up, before you do anything, slide out of bed on your knees. You'd be surprised how easy that is. It's a lot easier to slide out on your knees than to stand up. And just, even if it's just for a few minutes, just at least acknowledge God and the first thing in your life and acknowledge that waking up every morning in and out of itself is a miracle. And then allow yourself to be God's instrument. Ask God and say, God, here I am. Use me today. Guide me today. Let me be your servant. Let me be your disciple today. And see what that does for your life and what that does for the illnesses, for the depression, for the struggles for the demonic attacks. See what that does for that. You'll be surprised. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Father, thank you for just the mercy and the, the patience that you have with us. Father, Give us a desire to seek you and to change our lives and to begin a new life today if we haven't already in discipleship, Father, that a lifestyle, a new lifestyle that reflects a walk with you. Father, bless us uh, with a newness. It's not about uh, being prophets. It's not about having some kind of special gift as a pastor or as a youth pastor or as a leader. But God, just allowing ourselves to open our hearts to you and to fill our hearts with you, to fill that empty space that's in us with time with you, with a walk with you, with prayer with you, Father, with your word. We trust that as we let go of the world that you will catch us and that you will Fill our hearts with something that is beyond expression, something that is beyond explanation or description. God, thank you for your mercies. And bless us with faith, Father. Faith that miracles are capable, are able, are possible. That if we put our faith in you, Father, we will begin to see miracles in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath.